O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration, and there proclaim, my God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Know Your Stuff. I am your host, Miss Emily. Today's topic is going to be... Worship! I'm going to read you some things, and you're going to give me a thumbs up if you think it's true, meaning that it is right, or you're going to give me a thumbs down if it's false, meaning that you don't think it's right. So I'm going to give you a sentence, and when you hear the music stop after, then you'll show me your answer. All right, let's practice. True or false, we are in the month of August. All right, the music stopped, so show me your answer. You should have given me a thumbs up because that is true. Okay, are you guys ready for the real stuff? So like I said, today's topic is worship. Worship is when we share our hearts with God and show Him how much we thank Him. 
All right, let's go. To be a good Christian, you must sit very still and as quiet as a mouse in church. Is this true or is this false? Don't put your thumbs up or down yet. Wait for the music to stop. All right, show me your answer. If you had a thumbs down, you were correct. So while it's good to be respectful and not running around going crazy like this, it's also okay to wiggle a little bit, you guys. If you're sitting in your chair, you're kicking your feet a little bit, and you're squirming around, it's okay because God made you exactly the way he wanted you to be. All right, ready for your next one? True or false, you can worship anywhere you feel ready to. Show me your hands. You should have given me a thumbs up for this. This is true. You should worship in times that you feel led, even if you're not at church. So right now, as you can see, I'm in the car. And a lot of times if I'm in the car, I'll hear a song that just really shows me how beautiful God is. And so I might take a minute and say thank you to God or say a little prayer with my eyes open um, just to let God know how much I appreciate him. Or you might be out and about in nature and you look up at the trees and you find, wow, God is so beautiful that he gave us these trees and you take a minute and you pray. So worship doesn't have to be at church, even though worshiping at church is really amazing and you get to worship with a lot of people um, and, and praise him with a lot of people. It's okay if it's not always at church. All right, you guys are getting really good at this. Let's go to our third challenge. To be good at worshiping, you have to have your hands in your lap or folded behind your back. Is this true or is this false? All right, show me your answer. You should have given me a thumbs down. This is not true. Sometimes Miss Emily even writes notes and draws pictures during the sermon to remember what the preacher is talking about. And sometimes it kind of tells us what God is trying to show us. So remember, it's okay if you have to move your hands during worship. If you're drawing or writing or moving your fingers through a finger labyrinth, it's okay because God wants us to worship him by offering him our time and our talents. All right, the last and final challenge. True or false, it doesn't matter if I sing a little funky during worship. All right, guys, so you should have given me a thumbs up. That is true. It is okay if you sing funky or a little bit off key in worship. I have Tim here, and he's our worship leader. Tim, what do you think about kids that sing off key? I think it's totally okay, and as long as you make a joyful noise to the Lord, and that goes for you grown-ups, too. <laughs> he's talking to me, I think. <laughs> anyway, guys, it's totally okay whether you don't have that gift of singing or you just don't have it yet. God loves that we are praising him with our whole hearts. In the book of Ephesians in the Bible, chapter 5, verse 19 tells us, Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. But it doesn't say, only if you're good, though. The energy and meaning from you singing is what helps him know that you are thankful. Wow, you guys did a really great job today. I hope you learned something about worship. I want you guys to remember, worship is when we take time to thank God and we give him our attention. And it's really cool because we can do that with our whole bodies because God made us that way. Let's pray together in a repeat after me prayer. So I'll give you some time after I say a little part of it and then you'll repeat it and then we'll go on to the next part. God, we thank you for the chance to worship you, for the chance to praise you, just the way you made us. Amen.
morning, as we go to God in prayer, I invite you to participate. When I say, merciful God, you join me in saying, hear our prayer. So sisters and brothers, confident in God's love in Jesus Christ, let us pray for the world and for our needs, saying, merciful God, hear our prayers. O oh God, you have called forth the church to embody your way of life. Help those who profess faith in Christ to be faithful disciples and live according to your word. For all who follow Jesus Christ, merciful God, hear our prayer. O oh God, your children imitate you by speaking truth, showing forgiveness and dwelling together in loving community. For our neighbors and our neighborhoods, that we may live in peace and justice. Merciful God, hear our prayer. O oh God, our civic leaders face daily challenges and temptations. For government officials that they may have integrity of heart and wisdom of judgment in their performance of public service. Merciful God, hear our prayer. O oh God, the people of earth hunger for the spiritual food you provide, food that gives meaning to life. But many also hunger for good bread, for safe drinking water, and for the bare necessities of life. For those who struggle against the dehumanizing power of poverty, and for those who pursue justice in the sharing of earth's resources, Merciful God, hear our prayer. O oh God, your world is filled with the delights of natural beauty, but also with the danger of natural disaster. For planet Earth, our collective home, that all people may dwell in peace with the land, honoring its beauty conserving its resources and respecting its power. Merciful God, hear our prayer. O oh God of grace and mercy, hear the prayers of your people and grant that what we ask in faith, we may receive according to your gracious love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. 
it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So recently I was listening to a podcast uh, that mentioned uh, the death of a famous puppeteer named Elka Schumann. Uh, Elka and her husband Peter, they founded the Bread and Puppet Theater Company in 1963. Now their theater company based in Vermont, they were known for making these massive, sometimes monstrous uh, puppets that would reach upwards of 20 feet tall. They were also known at their performances for a peculiar practice. They would distribute fresh baked bread to all those in the audience to enjoy while they watched the performance. See, the, the Bread and Puppet Theater uh, Company, they were based on a farm and they, they, ground it, uh, they ground their own grains and they turned those grains into uh, delicious sourdough rye bread. That was the, the bread they preferred to bake. Now their performances, they would distribute this fresh baked bread to all those in attendance. And in the podcast, they played an audio clip of Elka Schumann describing the purpose behind this odd practice of, of giving this fresh baked bread. And this is what she had to say. She said that we grind the grain ourselves and the bread is not at all like your average supermarket bread. You really have to chew it. You really have to put some work into it. But then you get something good for it, she says. And when our theater is successful, we feel the same way. Now the director uh, went on to explain that she felt that like the bread, their theater performances were quite complex. They took some effort to understand, to interpret, to engage with, that it wasn't Wonder Bread theater, so to speak. But if a play was successful, the audience would, in her words, feel it was worth the extra work. Now, in our scripture text today, Jesus had also just uh, finished feeding a large audience, 5,000 people with just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And after he crosses uh, the Sea of Galilee, the crowd decides to follow after him. And when they finally catch up with Jesus, he challenges them to think about what kind of bread they're actually searching for. Uh, Jesus tells the crowd not to clamor for food that perishes. Instead, he urges the crowd to seek after food that lasts, food from God that, quote, endures for eternal life. Jesus says there's bread that perishes and there's bread that endures. Which are you after? That's Jesus' question to the crowd. Is it wonder bread or something a bit heartier? Quick entertainment, cheap calories, or something more enduring, more nourishing? What are you after? I am the bread of life, Jesus says in our text today. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again. Jesus says that he is himself the food that lasts, this bread of life. There's something about the, the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that reveals some fundamental truths about who God is, about who we are, why we're here, who we're called to be, who we are becoming, what we are to do. And this, Jesus says, this is the bread that endures. Now, another way that we could explore Jesus' statement, I am the bread of life, is to hear it in the form of a question. What is your bread of life? 
What is your bread of life? That, I believe, is the underlying question for you and me today as we hear this story. Jesus says to the crowd and to us today, what is your bread of life? Is it a bread uh, that, that perishes or a bread that endures? What is your bread of life? Now, the truth is, friends, that we're all always looking for a bread of life. Something we can put our hope in, something we can entrust our lives to, something that will validate our lives, that will bring uh, our lives a sense of meaning and purpose and direction. We're all always looking for a bread of life. Now, sometimes a bread of life is something that you could have if only you did X, Y, or Z. If only you bought this product or subscribed to this service, if only you tried this diet or did a bit more yoga or you ate more kale, if only your life looked a bit more like uh, those influencers on Instagram, if only you were the perfect spouse, the perfect parent, the perfect child, perfect friend, if only you worked more, hustled a bit harder, if only you implemented this life hack or you bought this perfect planner that's going to help you get your mess together, if only you downloaded another app on your phone, if only, if only, if only, then maybe, maybe you'd finally be okay with yourself. Then maybe finally you'd be okay in the world. Then maybe you'd find that sense of meaning and purpose and direction for your life. Sometimes a bread of life is something you already have that serves as a sort of grounding principle in your life, something that provides your life with validation, with meaning. Maybe it's an impressive resume or a fancy degree from a fancy school or an honorary or professional title on your name. Maybe a car that you drive that reflects your refined tastes or uh, that, that prove that you are a man's man or that you are eco-conscious. Maybe it's a certain affiliation with a political party or a religious denomination or some other club or group or tribe. Maybe it's a perfect family with perfect kids and the, the house with the white picket fence. Maybe it's a busy schedule that's full of important things to do and places to be. These kinds of breads of life, they promise fulfillment. They promise validation. They promise a sense of, of meaning and purpose and direction in your life. The truth is, friends, that we live in a day and age where we are constantly inundated, maybe even assaulted, by messages and advertisements and sales pitches and campaigns and dogmas and ideologies, all promising to be for us a particular bread of life. The question is, are these breads that perish or breads that endure? Jesus in John 6 today, he claims to be the bread that endures, the bread of life. But the crowd, they put it quite bluntly when they say uh, essentially to Jesus, why should we trust you? Right? Why should we trust you, Jesus, uh, over these other kinds of bread out there? God gave our, our ancestors uh, the, the manna in the wilderness. What sort of sign can you give us? What can you show us to, to prove that we should trust you? And like the crowd, we too demand signs, don't we? Can't you just see us standing there in the crowd saying to Jesus, all right, Jesus, just, so this guy over here, he promises that I can get rich quick in just three easy steps. What can you do for me? Or maybe this product promises to, to make me look and feel 10 years younger. What can you do, Jesus? Or this, this talking head over here, he, uh, he graduated from an Ivy League school and it says he's an entrepreneur with a, quote, proven track record of success. What can you show for yourself, Jesus? Or this, this club, this group, this tribe, whatever it is, they, they validate all of my opinions and they promise to never make me uncomfortable, to never challenge me to consider the potential flaws of my, old, my own worldview. What can you promise me, Jesus? What can you say? We, just like the crowd, we are searching for a bread 
of life, some sort of source of sustenance, a grounding principle in our lives, something that validates our lives, that, that provides them with meaning and purpose, something or someone we can stake our lives on. Our hopes, our dreams, our aspirations, we're all always looking for a bread of life. We're searching for this bread, and there's an awful lot of snake oil out there promising us a bread of life. And so, like the crowd, we demand signs. Why should we trust you, Jesus, over these other competing claims? You say that you are the bread of life, but, but how do you measure up to all these other competing claims that are speaking to us, shouting to us at all times, these other breads? How do you measure up, Jesus? What can you show us? What makes you the bread that endures? Now, the crowd asks for a sign, something like the manna God gave their ancestors in the wilderness. And Jesus essentially says to them, I am the manna. I am myself the sign. We might ask, what kind of sign was the manna uh, to begin with? Manna in the, the Exodus story was God's way of visibly demonstrating God's desire to be in relationship with the people of Israel. In the Gospel of John, it opens up with this description of the Word of God, the Word that spoke all things into existence. And this Word, the Gospel writer says, was with God and was God in the beginning. And this Word put on flesh and walked among us. The Gospel of John claims, it proclaims that Jesus is that Word that put on flesh. Jesus is the Word made flesh, God incarnate. Now, like the manna, Jesus, the, the Word made flesh, is God's ultimate way of demonstrating God's desire to be in relationship with you and me. We all know that any meaningful relationship, it requires trust. The Israelites, they had to trust that God would indeed provide manna, enough manna for not just for today, but for tomorrow also. God told the Israelites to take just what they needed for today and to trust that it would be enough and that God would provide again tomorrow. And those who didn't trust, those who took more manna than they in fact needed, they found that their manna ultimately began to spoil. Eating manna in the wilderness that required trust. And so does eating this bread of life. Whoever comes to me, whoever believes, that is whoever trusts in me, Jesus says, will never hunger, will never thirst again. Now this is precisely what Jesus offers. This, he offers an, an abiding relationship with God built on trust that deepens over the course of a lifetime. The question is, what is your bread of life? What do you trust? Who do you trust with your life? Bread that perishes or bread that endures, this bread of life? Now, like the bread and puppet theater's hearty sourdough rye bread, Jesus, our bread of life, may be a bit harder to chew than those other breads out there. But over the course of a life, we may find that it was, in the end, worth the extra work. Other breads promise to satiate, but just like Wonder Bread, they leave much to be desired. And I can hear Jesus saying to the crowd today, saying to you and me right here in this moment, look, I don't care all that much about making you rich in three easy steps. I'm not all that impressed by the car you drive or the house you live in or the fancy degree you've got. I can't promise to, to validate all of your opinions, to never challenge you or never make you uncomfortable. I've been known to step on a few toes in my day, enough to get me hung up on a cross. I hear Jesus saying, there's a lot of things I can't be for you. There's a lot of things I can't promise. But I can show you a deeper 
the more beautiful way of being human. I can help you find peace with God, peace with yourself, with your neighbor, and by God's grace, even peace with your enemy. I can be there with you as you struggle to forgive that person who wronged you, or when you're trying to muster up the courage and the humility to apologize for your own wrongdoing. I can be there with you through that. I can walk with you through your grief and your suffering. I'll weep when you weep. I will rejoice when you rejoice. I'll call you to a higher purpose, and I will fill your life with a deeper meaning. There's a lot of things I can't promise, and I can't be for you, but I can be with you. There's bread that perishes, and there is bread that endures, bread of life. The question for us is, what is your bread of life? Amen. Give life.